The Lord said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed about the ground, the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 These parables of seeds reveal grace as a gift God gives to us and through us in Jesus. As an 18-year-old, after I graduated from high school, I asked my parents to send me on a trip to visit my paternal grandfather, my grandpa Price, in Nashville, Tennessee, and then to fly from Nashville to visit my other set of grandparents in Wichita, Kansas. And I'm so glad I asked for that graduation gift. And those times were so rich with both of my grandparents, I still remember so many of the conversations we had around kitchen tables and in museums. It's like grandparents love museums. They just, they, it's like, let's go to a museum. So that's, you know, we did those things. But in Wichita, I also had the opportunity to spend time with my Uncle John. Now, my Uncle John was someone who was a, an accountant for a private equity firm that hedged uh, cattle against oil. So they had oil interests and they had cattle interests. And so basically in their experience, you know, when oil was low, beef was high, vice versa. So that's how they, that's how they kind of ran there. And he was the accountant for the owner of the firm. And so he took me out to go see the ranch that was out in the foothills of Kansas. So we got in his, you know, sedan and we drove a few, you know, a few hours west. Park went into the garage owned by the company and went, got into a big pickup truck. And then, you know, in the pickup truck, we went out onto those gravel roads in central Kansas. And he showed me, you know, the fields and he could show me, like, this is bad land management. You know, they're not managing their cows right. And, you know, here's, you know, you can see the fence line, the difference between how the land had been grazed. And it was, it was just a wonderful time. I mean, he gave me all kinds of advice. You know, and this was, he gave me one of my favorite sayings, which I still say as the dean of the cathedral and as the canon for the bishop. When I talk to other clergy, I say, well, advice is worth what it costs you. I got that from my uncle on that trip. He, kind of, he gave me advice about, you know, about love and marriage and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Said, well, it's a, advice is worth what it costs you, bro. And one of the things that he wanted me to understand about the ranching operation is he said, now, Rob, we're not here raising cows. That's not what the business is. We're here raising grass. Actually, we're simply harvesting the grass. See, the cows, the, the cows are merely an instrument for harvesting the grass. You see, he said, you see, this grass just kind of grows out here. It's in fact the only thing that will grow out here unless you pour tons of water from the Ogallala Reservoir all over it. Then you can grow corn out here. You know, you'll grow corn if you pour water on it. But if you just let things go, he says what's grown out here for millennia, it fed the bison herds, is this grass. It just grows on its own. And he said, we're just here to harvest it. You see, because people don't eat grass, but they do eat cows. <laughs> and that's the whole operation. He said, that's the whole operation. That's the logic of a cow farm in Kansas. We're not raising cows, we're harvesting grass. The cows were, of course, what everybody saw. Right there, everybody thinks, well, you know, like, you have a ranch, you got the cows, you got cowboys, the cows are what the cowboys manage. But everything. Everything that happened there was dependent upon the growth of the grass, which again, basically grew on its own out there. You didn't have to try very hard. Now, of course, every gardener knows that there is more to do than just watch the grass grow. But that's a different sermon. <laughs> the force of the parables that Jesus tells us this morning Part of the force of the parable is our total powerlessness over the mechanism of growth, right? The, he, he casts the seed and he, it's like he goes, he goes inside, you know, goes sleepy night night, wakes up in the morning, crops are there, right? He doesn't know how that happens. Then a sense God's grace and his love are given to us 
not as something that we can manage or control or understand, but as sheer gift. It's like you just wake up and it's there. That's the meaning, that's the force of the parable. We know not how God's love is constantly working, how the kingdom of God is growing, but we receive its fruit, its blessings, as a gift. Another metaphor that Paul uses is inheritance, that we receive an inheritance. Again, it's something that you don't work for, right? otherwise it would be wages. So Paul has a couple paragraphs about, hey, if you work for it, it's hey, something you get paid, right? But if you just receive it from your father as a gift, it's an inheritance. And God's love, his blessings are kind of like that. It's like an inheritance. Not something you work for, it's something you receive, but then it really does become yours in the end. Right? I mean, in inheritance, once it's probated, and beloved, God's love was probated to you on a, the hill of Golgotha. That was the probate. And it is now yours. It's a gift that is truly yours. Another metaphor that ties into inheritance that Paul uses is sonship. This is like Romans 8, where I'm talking about, for those of you who want to do homework later. Sonship, it's an identity that comes with an inheritance. That he says we are co-heirs in Christ, and this is what he's getting at. Basically, you didn't work for it. It's something that's given to you, and yet it is once you receive it, truly yours. St. Ambrose, when he preached on this passage, St. Ambrose was, you know, around the early 400s or so. He said that Christ chose to be planted in the earth as a seed which a man took and cast into his garden. That is, it says the image that St. Ambrose uses that the Father is the gardener and cast Christ as the seed into the ground of the earth, his, God's garden, of course, tying back to Genesis, right? Ambrose went on to say, Christ is a seed when he is buried in the earth, and he is a tree when raised in heaven. We fly to him for shelter and make our home in him. Jesus has the seed, has the one who is planted in the ground in his death and raised up as our shelter and our home in his resurrection, has pure gift, has an inheritance for the people of God. It is powerful to know yourself as gifted in this way. It should transform how you think about your life and your future. I'll never forget teaching confirmation classes. That's basically an Episcopal form of hazing. We take the youngest person on the staff and we make them try to sell Jesus to eighth graders. That's what we do. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a legacy. It's your inheritance. Looking at something in particular in congregation. It's your inheritance. But in one of these confirmation retreats, where it was kind of this retreat, and I, I did my retreat structured along the curriculum of the Alpha Course, for those of you who know that. And so basically, I had three weekends, you know, kind of Jesus weekend, kind of formation weekend, where you talk about the Bible and this prayer and all this stuff, and then Holy Spirit weekend. And so Jesus weekend is the first weekend, and we start out with, you know, and that Jesus died for you, but trying to, in a sense, get those eighth grade minds that are doing algebra, right? so they can x equal, you know, y equals x plus 2, they can graph that, so their little brains are now capable of abstract thought, of placeholding, you know, abstract. So that's what, I mean, this is why basically brothers and sisters, this is kind of an editorial comment, it's free of no charge, the rest of the This is why we do confirmation or bar mitzvah at this time, because children's brains are ready 
to think abstractly. In particular, to connect someone dying 2,000 years ago with the life they're living today. That requires abstract thought. That requires you to be able to connect some dots. Adults sometimes have a hard time with that. I mean, like, we're all sort of learning algebra in some ways, am I right? It's a more spiritual algebra. But this eighth grade boy, after the kind of presentation about Jesus' love given in his sacrifice on the cross, came up to me. And this is, I remember this because eighth grade boys typically don't come up to teacher slash priest slash whoever, right? And he said to me, I never thought that someone would do that for me. It, it occurred to him that he was worthy of that sort of love. For the first time in his life, eyes open. He received an inheritance that day. He received his inheritance that day. It was something that he didn't make. He simply received. It was a gift. He received the gift. And that is part of what Jesus is trying to get at with the parables, the seeds. The other aspect of Jesus' teaching on seeds is that God's grace is not only given to us, it certainly is given to us, but not only to us. But God's grace is also given through us. It's not just something that's kind of applied to us as a salve on a wound, although it is kind of that. It is also a power that flows through us into others. For if Christ is the seed, then God is still busy scattering it in word and in sacrament. God planted a seed in my heart as I was praying in the late spring of 2018. And as I was praying, I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't have my Bible open, but the Holy Spirit impressed a verse on my mind, and I could see it in front of my eyes as if my NRSV was open. And that verse was one of the verses we read this morning. It's from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Be a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything's made new. <laughs> Being a new creation. And so I prayed. I've been, I've been the rector of St. Dunstan's for about 12 and a half years, and to be a new creation. I thought, well, I don't know what that means. And then, I kid you not, as I, I, I kept on wrestling with that verse, kept coming back to it in prayer, and a week later, Canon Michael Jilton, known to some of you, called me and said, would you be interested in entering into the search process to become the dean of the field? God is still busy scattering seeds. Now, whether or not that seed bore fruit or a weed, is the jury's still out. <laughs> but he's busy scattering seeds in word and in sacrament. Think of every host that I place into a hand as a seed of God's loving, recreating power placed in new soil. Every seed. Every host is a seed of the kingdom of God seeking to lodge in the soil of our heart. Now seeds are small things, aren't they? They're humble things. They have to be, they have to be in order to work their little way into the soil, right? You know, in order to kind of get down into where they need to be, they better be small. And I suppose that God's love needs to be a small seed in order to slip into the cracks of our concrete sidewalk hearts. We can be deceived, however, because influenced by how the world judges significance and power, 
We hear that the kingdom has large branches. Ooh, large branches. Under, underscore large. No, that's, that, that's important. Large branches. And becomes the greatest of all the great, ooh, greatest. It's the like greatest on earth. That's a good service, right? The greatest service. It's the greatest. Underline that word. Highlight it. Highlight it. I'm going to bring that up in my Bible study on Wednesday morning. The greatest of all shrubs. And we think that the kingdom is revealed to us wherever we see size and success, right? In my parish in Houston, there was a summer where we had kind of a crisis. There was a crisis of confidence there on, the, on the part of the body, on part of our lady. You see, we had a vacation Bible school, and we thought we had done really well because we had we cracked a hundred kids at our vacation Bible school for the first time in a long time. So it was about great, you know, a hundred kids. And then the next week, Champion Forest Baptist Church had their vacation Bible school, and they had over a thousand children there. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's like a it's like two elementary schools over there. Did we fail? Why? Why, God? Why? Or is your kingdom not growing here? But the force of the parable that Jesus tells is that seeds, in their very smallness, possess a power that is all the greater given how hidden it is. You see, a seed has the power to turn soil into itself. Have you thought about that? Then it says if you, if you take like a starter plant, you know that they have in nurseries to give this children, or you know the teachers on Teacher Appreciation Day, you know those little plants, little containers, like that. or you know your little pine tree in a little, you know, little container, you know, plastic container. Now, if you leave the tree or the plant in that tiny little black plastic container, right, eventually. If you leave it there and you don't put it into more soil, eventually, and then you pull it, pull it out, it's going to be mostly roots, right? You hear my can coming out when I say the word. It's going to be mostly roots. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I got, that's my, that's my can of grandmother, like, just speaking through my mouth right there. But it's going to be mostly roots. Not soil. There won't be a whole lot of soil. Have you seen that happen? That's, but think about that. That's the power of the seed transforming soil into itself. Those roots didn't go, come out of nothing. And those roots weren't contained in that tiny little small seed. Rather, the seed unleashed a power that was able to transform the soil into itself. It's been transformed, unleashed by the power of the broken seed into tree stuff that can take everything that's good in the soil, that can pull everything good that's in the soil around it and make it produce fruit. Make it produce fruit. And you think about what's the purpose of fruit? The purpose of fruit is not to be eaten by the tree, right? It's to be eaten by other stuff. That's the whole point of the fruit. It's not for the benefit of the tree. Well, I mean, there's what in, what is in those fruit? What's in the fruit? Seeds, yes. Ah, seed. oh, now, now we're getting into some kingdom symbology, right? It produces fruit, food, something others can eat. Has a gift from the original seed. The what those who eat the fruit see is the tree. Not the seed that gave them the fruit that they're eating. Such is the hidden power of the seed. A seed, the humble, simple, small seed, has the power to split sidewalks. For those of us in East Dallas, those big trees, and make a sidewalk feel like that. A seed has the power to split sidewalks has the power to break foundations, has the power to shatter rocks, which means it has the power to open tombs, seeds. 
God's seed, Jesus, is both our inheritance and the power behind our mission, our purpose. Scattered amongst us, growing has a gift, a gift that transforms us into itself. That's what St. Paul is talking about when he says, it's no longer me, but it's Christ in me. Because Jesus planted, you know, God planted that Jesus seed in Paul's heart. And to root there, unlikely soil that Saul was. But it took root there. And began to grow. And to fill his heart. And transform it into Jesus' own heart. Jesus is a seed planted in us as a gift that transforms us into itself. Making us fruit bearers, shelter givers. The starter batch of the new creation. 